This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, the podcast that introduces you to the rich world of storytellers who share their personal journeys, creative processes, and the stories behind their stories, one conversation at a time. I'm your host, Mike Carlin, and I'm thrilled to be part of your writing journey. If you're an aspiring writer, a literary enthusiast, or simply someone who believes in the transformative power of words, you've come to the right place. Every week, we'll pop the cork on the world of successful storytellers and give you a healthy pour of inspiration, insight, and empowerment. My mission is to help writers like you realize your full potential through the transformative and therapeutic power of writing. Whether you're just starting your literary voyage or looking to refine your craft, I'm here to provide you with the knowledge, inspiration, and encouragement you need to embark on your own storytelling adventure. So, are you ready to uncork your story and let your creativity flow? Uncorking a story is about to begin. Sit back, relax, and let the transformative magic of storytelling whisk you away. Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Laura Buckwald is a New York City-based writer and editor. The Coat Check Girl is her first novel and is part of a three-book series. In addition to writing, she co-hosts a podcast about the creative process called People Who Do Things. Welcome to Uncorking a Story, Laura. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to have you here. And I'm curious, Laura, where does your story as an author begin? As an author, I, I've thought about the difference many times between a writer and an author. My story as a writer begins um, in the mid-1970s, actually. I, I always sort of took to writing uh, from the time I could write. And I didn't really take, I, I didn't th- think I would be an author for many, many, many years. Um, I did a lot of freelance writing after college, um, articles, things like that. Every job I ever had entailed writing. And I would dabble in fiction. And then sometime around 2006 or seven, the, the first germ of the idea for The Coat Check Girl came to me. And I um, decided to see if I actually could write a novel. I didn't know what would happen. I just set out in a meandering path. A meandering path beginning perhaps in the 1970s. I'm curious, going back to, let's get in our DeLorean and go back to the the lovely 70s because yes. uh, I was born way back then. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, how did it manifest itself kind of writing in, in those younger years for you? I wrote a lot of poetry, um, very earnest, very rhymy poetry. I uh, actually was named the outstanding poet of George Washington Elementary School in uh, what would third grade be? Um, I guess when I was eight or eight, right? Yeah, so like 1978-ish. Eight yeah. Um, and then I wrote, you know, whenever we had a creative writing assignment, I loved to, to do those. Uh, when I was in fourth grade, my creative writing teacher told me that I had to stop ending every story with, and then he woke up and it was all a dream. I, you know, I had the imagination, but I didn't have the follow through. That reminds me of the um, a season opener for Dallas. If you remember that lovely show back in the I, day. I remember I only saw the JR getting shot episode. I'm sorry if I just spoiled it for anybody. Well, it's been a few years. Let's be fair. It's been a few years, but I think there was, um, I think it was Bobby, his brother, who, uh, who was killed off. But then in the, in a season opener, they, uh, they pulled that, you know, it was all a dream. Trope. Right. And Newhart, wasn't that oh all gosh, a dream? That's how, that's how Newhart ended. Yeah. That's how, that's how so the, the Newhart, which was the second, you know, sitcom he was on, because he was on the Bob Newhart show yeah. in the 70s. They ended the, uh, the later series with him um, having woken up from a dream. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that the entire series. series. Was just with Larry, Daryl and Daryl. That was uh-huh. a classic show. A classic show. So uh, 2000, you say 2007, 2008, you, you kind of get the, the thought in your head to, okay, maybe you'll try some fiction. How, how did that come to be? It, I mean, it's very tied into the Coach Check Girl. Actually, now that I think about it, it was 2006 um, when I started thinking about it. Um, the book is set in the restaurant worlds of New York and New Orleans. And uh, it's... The main restaurant in it is based upon a restaurant that I used to frequent on 9th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues. It was then called Village. 
And I spent a lot of time there. I got to know the staff and see how they interacted and, and you know, work together as a, a dysfunctional but loving family. Um, and at the same time, I started getting these creepy feelings when I would go into the ladies room on the second floor. And one day I asked, jokingly asked the bartender if the ladies room was haunted. And he said, yeah, a lot of people think it is. So those two elements combined to form the impetus for this. Wow. So now my my next logical question is, uh, when did you first know that you could kind of experience, you know, whether or not a place was haunted or sense that a place was haunted? It wasn't a, so my sister and I are pretty sure the house we grew up in was haunted and we never really talked about it as kids. Um, but as adults, we, you know, we, we shared experiences. There was nothing very tangible for me except feelings, you know, the same feeling I had at village restaurant going into the ladies room. It was the basement of that house. I'm getting the creepy feeling now, but the basement of the house and the attic of the house, there was some energy there. Um, but it was just sort of the way it was. I, I don't know. I didn't, we didn't really talk about it. Um, and then I'm trying to remember what my first, I had a couple of like uncannily prescient, prescient, prescient moments, um, as a kid where I just sensed something, um, had happened and, you know, I, or I heard something before somebody said it. And so I, I kind of always was aware that there was something else besides the five senses. Uh, and I didn't know how to articulate it. Um, and then in uh, like the, I guess around 2003, 2004, I started, I, I had a couple of really striking experiences where I walked into a place and just sensed that someone had passed there recently and it was, and they had, um, and I went to my first medium in 2004 and it was stunningly accurate. And it was also, you know, just the, the dawn of social media. If you had looked me up, you wouldn't have seen anything about people I was connected to who had passed. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm, I'm so curious, um, the, um, just the, the sensitivity you have and mm -hmm. then maybe your sister has as well. Did you hide it from each other? Did you hide it from like friends and family members? That's like, a good question. I don't think I, I intentionally hid it. I think as a kid, there was like, and this is actually kind of a quote from my book as well about my protagonist, but there was so much that made me feel other that this was just another layer that it was like, all right, I've got that too. And, you know, people don't really talk about it. Um, so no, I didn't intentionally hide it. And it also wasn't such like a major part of my childhood. It was just these, these moments here and there, these, these, um, I guess you call it clairsentient moments. Um, so no, but now, you know, the secret is out. My whole family knows. My sister will say, can you walk in there and tell me if that room is haunted? Um, <laughs> you know, and, and interestingly, when I started researching this book, I would, I spent a lot of time in New Orleans where it partially takes place. Those feelings and experiences sort of dried up once I started chasing them. Oh, interesting. Interesting. All right. So they, they went on the run mm -hmm. as, as you're becoming or trying to become enlightened about this stuff. Yeah, I, I still have them every now and then. And I still I've spoken with many mediums over the years um, to varying degrees of, of accuracy. Um, but some of them are just there are some very good ones out there. Yeah, very, very, very interesting. Yeah, I've been um, so my uh, my brother died. Um, I'm so sorry. Back in June of 2023. So a little, you know, over a year, year and a half ago or so. And uh, my mother passed away this past July. My father passed away this past July. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry for you as well. I've been like bathing in grief ever since mm -hmm. then. And over that time period, and I, I had some interesting experiences with people who were dying. Um, I was, uh, I don't know if you say blessed or cursed to mm -hmm. uh, watch my mother-in-law transition. Mm -hmm. And then I was with my brother when, when he passed away. And I was with my mother when mm -hmm. she passed away. So I've, um, 
I've seen a lot of interesting things. Um, seen a, you know, th- sample size of three, but seen a couple of patterns. And I started to investigate, you know, a lot of this sort of stuff that happens when, when one passes over. Um, and uh, it's really kind of opened my eyes to, hey, yeah. there's something a little bit bigger out there than, than, as you say, we could experience with, with our five senses. Yeah, absolutely. And to get back to what you just said, I, I've now been with two different people, my father and a friend when they transitioned. Um, I think we're blessed. It, it, it's, you know, I, I think it, it makes a difference in, in the grieving process. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly not easy, but I'm so glad that I was able to be there. Yeah, it's, uh, I was listening to an interview this week. Actually, my sister-in-law turned me on to it uh, with John Edwards uh-huh. who, from uh, from the old crossing over with John. He's Edwards. he's the OG he's, medium. He's the OG of the TV uh, mediums. Uh, yeah. I actually went to a taping of his once way back in the two, early 2000s uh, mm-hmm. when he was filming in, in Queens. But um, so I, I had absolutely knew who he was and I was listening to it and he was actually addressing I was he was dressing people who were grieving and you know he was talking about hey if if your loved one chooses to cross over when you're not in the room that's the way it was meant to be. Yeah. And if your loved one chooses to cross over with you present then that's the way they wanted it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'd like to think that I was picked for a reason. I haven't really figured out what that reason is quite yet. But um there's definitely a reason there. Yeah, well I mean the grieving process is one of is really the universal experience, um, you know, that, that unites all of us since my father's passed and, and, you know, everybody I encounter, I went, we have a celebration of life this weekend and I, um, went to pick up the programs that we had made at FedEx and I got teary. It's so beautiful. And I got teary when the guy handed it to me and a woman next to me just, put her hand on my shoulder and said, you know, it gets easier. And he was so lucky to have you. Like, I didn't even have to explain what was going on there. You know, it's, it's just such a universal democratic, it, you know, crosses everything that divides us. Grief is one thing that can unite us if we let it. Um, And it's also such an individual experience, you know, no one's, I don't know. I've learned, and you probably have too, a, a lot about the way people attempt to relate to you after you've lost a parent. Um, you know, and everybody means well. It's just, it's so individual that it's hard to offer platitudes. And, you know, I don't know. I, I learned a lot about how to comfort people and what to do and what not to do. It was explained to me by a uh, a wonderful uh, social worker, uh, LCSW named Cindy, that mm-hmm. grief really is the doorway to empathy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, having, oh, I love that. having those shared experiences, like shared grief, um, you know, you don't really understand what it's like to lose a parent until you've lost a parent. Mm-hmm. And then you can understand how to comfort somebody who's lost a parent or a sibling or a spouse or a child. Right. Right. All those horrible things to think about, but um, it really is the pathway to empathy. Uh, that's beautiful. Yeah. I'm going to steal that. I think I just I, did. I think I I, I'm, I'm going to steal that from you. <laughs> Borrow with pride. I will. Uh, well, you've talked about the coat check girl a couple of times. Tell us what, what can you share with us about the coat check girl? I love the cover, which you can see behind me. Sorry. I mirrored my video. Um, uh, so the Coat Check Girl takes place in the summer of 1999 in New York and a little bit in New Orleans. And it is the story of Josie, who just before it begins, has has lost her grandmother, who was her best friend, who was um, the only person she ever felt really understood her. You know, she was somebody who grew up feeling very other and her grandmother was always accepting and was really her best friend. So she's grieving she's returned to new york to her restaurant job at bistro which is based on village and um you know she is one of many people who work there who came to new york to do different things took a restaurant job and stayed there long past they thought that you know long past what they thought their expiration date there would be so she's got her found family who's comforting her at the same time um she 
realizes that this long dormant ability to sense spirits has returned with her grandmother's passing. And it's something she always uh, fought off as a kid and something, you know, she felt um, she, she did not accept at all. Her grandmother also had the ability, um, but her grandmother viewed it as a gift. Josie viewed it as scary and, you know, made, made her even stranger than she already was. And she befriends the new coat check girl. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned this, but it's a very rainy summer. So the restaurant has to hire a coat check girl unusually. And this is Mia, who's from New Orleans. So who completely understands the ghost thing. It's just a given. Um, and so it's really about her. It's it's not a ghost story per se. It's really about Josie's quest to find her way now that her anchor is gone. Uh, and there happen to be ghosts in it. Interesting. Interesting. I love that. Uh, it's almost like when, when, when Ben Kenobi, uh, <laughs> loses to Dar I loses to Darth Vader. <laughs> like, like it was, a, like it was a, like it was an election. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't get me started. Darth, Darth Vader's probably not a bad analogy, but, uh, but, uh, you know, when, when he gets str stricken down and he says, uh, I'll be more powerful than, than I ever was. And then all of a sudden Luke starts hearing him. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm a kid of the seventies and eighties. Right. I, I immediately went to star Wars. As Yeah. I live with somebody who immediately goes to star Wars. <laughs> there you go. Uh, why was it, um, you know, you mentioned specifically that it's set in 1999. Why, why 1999? Um, well, for one thing, when I started it, 1999 wasn't yet historical fiction as it is now. It, it's, I started it and I put it down and I picked it back up and put it down. And it wasn't until I guess like 2017, 2018 that I decided to see if I could really finish it. But also a couple of things. One is that I didn't feel that a book about grieving that happens to have ghosts in it set in downtown New York could work post nine 11 without nine 11 playing a role in it. Um, because again, at the time that I started it, 9-11 was a lot more recent and was still you know, very much part of like the tapestry of, of downtown New York. Um, and then also because there's some mystery in it, I wanted it to be pre the ubiquity of technology, of personal technology. Yeah. So you couldn't just Google someone and find out. I almost said something that would have given away a little. <laughs> okay. The good old days. The good old yes. days. Yes. We were tethered to our phones and our laptops and exactly. our lady of Google to, to mm -hmm. answer the question for us. I got it. I got it. Um, well, that's uh that's very cool. I um I I I love the idea, I love the premise. And um Thank you. what I want to dig into though is like the, the start and stops from writing it. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what was going on in your life during those periods of starts and stops. And why do you think, I think you mentioned 2017 was the time when um, you kind of picked it up again, seriously, like what, what was kind of going on in your life and, and why did the story wind up coming out of you when it did? It's a very good question. Um, I think in part, I didn't, you know, I never set out to be published. I, I set out to tell a story and I think that it didn't dawn on me that I could complete the story and then revise it and revise it and revise it and revise it and, you know, generate interest from an agent. I just it it never really dawned on me. Um, it was more it felt more like an exercise at the time. And, and so I was working on other things and I was doing some freelance writing. I was doing a lot of freelance editing. And, you know, writing is a very solitary endeavor and certainly takes discipline. Um, and I'm not a very solitary or disciplined person. So there was that element of it. Um, and then why did I pick it back up when I did? Events of 2016 had me wanting to find some something more purposeful to sink my teeth into, get me off of, you know, social media and this and that. Also, <laughs> at one point, somebody, I mean, I had, a, I have a job. I was doing my freelance work. At one point, someone asked me what was new and I told them what was new with my husband. And they said, okay, but what's new with you? And 
I came up short and that was, a, I, I, that was really the catalyst for my saying, you know what, I have this thing that I started, I actually won a first chapter contest in 2008. Um, and then I put it away. And I just thought like, I, I call myself a writer. I, am I a writer if I'm not actively writing? And so I wanted to be able to feel good about claiming that as part of my identity. Um, and also, you know, I, I had started other little fiction projects here and I shouldn't denigrate them. I'd started other fiction projects here and there, but these characters would not let me let them go. They kept coming back to me. I, I would have dreams about them. Um, and it just, something was telling me that I needed to write this story. Yeah. It has changed a lot over the years. It sounds like the, your characters were haunting you somewhat. Somewhat. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, we're looking at a, you know, for those of us looking at the video, um, I'm looking at the cover of the book. It, it is a stunning cover. I have it's to gorgeous. It's the, the uh, it's, it's a piece of art. Um, I, I agree. And that's my publisher, Ronan Weatherford, who, who is responsible for that. I, I keep forgetting. I'm not good with the mirrored video <laughs> over my right shoulder, which yeah. is your left. Um, yeah, it's gorgeous. And it, it captures the, th you know, it's, it's non-specific, but it to me it looks like the West Village, and it's rainy, and there's an element of mystery. You know, who is this woman? Where is she going? And um, yeah, I think they did a fabulous job. A friend of mine was in the airport reading it yesterday, and said three different people came up and asked what she was reading based on the cover. Yeah, it's uh, so they're, well, they're, yeah. you uh, you know th th those um, those old adages are not always right. Sometimes you can judge exactly. A book by its cover. <laughs> Exactly. Um, I'm, I'm also curious about your path to publication. I know this is part of a, a three book um, mm -hmm. series. How, wh when you were done writing it and you were ready to start sort of turning it from a manuscript to an actual book, mm -hmm. what was the process you took to, to get it out into the real world? Well, I worked with a couple of uh, book coaches to get it over the finish line. Um, and uh, the one who really got it over the finish line is a woman named Jill Dearman, who is a fabulous writer and book coach. And basically she said she, you know, she thought it was ready for me to query. I had knew nothing about that exhaustive process. Um, and I, I thought, you know, I said, okay, so how many people should I plan on querying? And she said 50 to a hundred. And for those who don't know, you know, you can't just send a blanket query out to everybody. Every single agent wants something slightly different. Some want the first five pages, some want the first three chapters, some want the entire manuscript, some want a synopsis, others don't. Um, and writing a synopsis is harder than writing a book. Um, some want to hear about your writing credentials and, and past awards and things like that. Others don't. So you really have to do exhaustive research, cross-reference in publisher's marketplace, manuscript wish list, go on to, you know, every agent's website and see what their little blurb is. Um, so I put together a very long list of agents and I started querying at the end of 2019 and then 2020 showed up and um, I just stopped querying. Obviously there was also a paper shortage. So publishing the publishing world was uh, not functioning uh, as well as it, it hopefully is doing now. But um, I started working on other things in 2020 and then that summer my agent reached out to me apologizing for the long delay, which, you know, 2020 was one long delay. Um, and she said that if I were willing to make some editorial changes, she'd like to work with me. And of course I was. And I agreed with all of most of the changes that she suggested. So we, I guess I finished in April or May of 2020, 2021. And she started submitting it she she submitted it to so we we had so many rounds of submission and she you know everything from from the big five the top five to like tiny little houses um to what i landed in which is somewhere in between and she kept saying i promise you we're going to find a home for this and you know it's very easy even though you know 
of course, it's not personal. It's a, this is a business, but every rejection, it feels like a rejection. I put together a poem of lines from my rejections and somebody in my writing group called it the saddest thing I've ever written. It's like, dear Laura, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't connect. I'm sorry. I just don't connect. You know, it's, you get these, these kind of stock responses. The worst one I got was you were right to send this to me as it is the sort of thing I would normally be interested in. However, I didn't connect to the material. Like you could have just said no, yeah, but you no, know, it's a, you mentioned agents wanting something different. Everyone wants something different. Mm-hmm. You can't just send a blanket, you know, letter to agents, but they all send you the same blanket letter back. Yeah, <laughs> they're, it's they're like, true. Can you just and, at least take your own advice? No. Well, you know, they they get so many submissions that they are looking to get through their pile by rejecting, you know, it, it's um And I get that, you know, when you're getting inundated with whether it's resumes for interviewing, you know, people at at my job or whatever it is, when you're getting inundated with stuff, you just like the more you can just rule out and, you know, so that you can hone in on on what works for you, um, the better, I guess. But so, yeah, it's it's hard. Rejection is it, you know, it's. I'm glad I believed her that we would one day find a home for it. Um, you know, independent self-publishing is a totally different game than it was, you know, even a couple of years ago. And it, it's it's absolutely a valid way to publish. And I was considering it. My podcast partner exclusively self-publishes and does a beautiful job with it. Um, and he does it by choice. And so I was strongly considering that. And then kind of in the 11th hour, she said, there's one publisher I know who I think will love it, but they only work in, or they prefer to work in multiples. Could you write a couple of sequels? I said, sure. And she's like, and how quickly can you get them done? I said, whatever, just tell them whatever they want to hear. Um, and we put together some very uh, perfunctory outlines of what books two and three might be like, and they accepted them. So So here we are. But it was, you know, it was several years and a lot of rejection. This is not a get rich quick scheme (laughs) or a um, or a get rich scheme. It's definitely not a get rich scheme. Okay, you're right. It's not a get published quick scheme. But, um, you know, when I've worked with aspiring novelists or first time right first time novelists or memoir writers and I ask them why they want to write and they say, you know, I, I'm just looking for another revenue stream or, you know, I need, I want to quit my job. And I'm like, oh, honey. But, um, you know, that said, if you can stick it out and if you can have faith in your work and know that there are so many publishers nowadays, it's not all about the big five. Yeah. I was in the elevator the other day at, during my day job. And uh, someone um, who works for me said, hey, you're 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 an author, right? I said, yes. She's like, how many books have you written? I'm like eight. And she's like, what are you still doing working here? Oh, my God. I'm like, are, I'm like, if you only knew. Yeah. If you only knew. Though I have to say, I worked at Random House uh, in when was that from 1999 to no, 1998 to like 2003. And one of the things I did was interview authors for a literary magazine that we had. And I remember I was arranging an interview and the woman said, well, I'll be temping at Random House, actually, so we can just do it in the office. And I was baffled. Like, why are you temping? You know, you've published a book. (laughs) But yeah, it it absolutely can open doors and it leads to other things. But in and of itself, it's not a... uh... It's not, a, you know, it, it, look, if you're J.K. Rowling or if you're James sure. Patterson or, or Stephen King, yeah, then. Exactly. One thing, but. Period. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I mean, but you, so you have to do it because you love it, right? Not because you plan to get published or certainly not because you want to make money. <laughs> that's 100% true. I want to hear more about your books, but I know that's not the point of this. Oh, yeah. No, we're, we're going to focus this on you. We could talk offline about that. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, what I'm curious about, um, in addition to your, your writing is your podcast. Can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about people who do things? 
Sure. Well, the name People Who Do Things comes from a Dorothy Parker poem about how exhausting artists and creatives are. And it ends with people who do things exceed my endurance. God for a man who solicits insurance. So uh, in 20, it came out of the pandemic, our podcast, my my. Uh, co-host John H. Matthews, who is a prolific and talented writer, novelist. And I actually met at a writing conference in 2016, and we'd always talked about doing something together. And then during the pandemic, we decided in earnest to do something together. And so uh, we had a really good clip going when we were all stuck at home. Obviously, that's changed a bit, but we still do it. Um, we, we just actually released one yesterday. Uh, and what we do is we either talk to writers, all sorts of writers, novelists, poets, journalists, mu- musicians, uh, screenwriters. Um, and we, we interview them about the creative process. That's, you know, one, one component, but most of the episodes are he and I talking about an aspect of writing. He's, he writes fiction as well. So it, can be, you know, secondary characters or researching location or, you know, just so, some aspect of the process. Um, and it's fun. It's a very homespun, you know, um, not fancy, but fun. And we love it. And uh, the people who do listen to it give us great feedback. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a lot of shows out there um, for people who love movies, mm-hmm. people who love bad movies people who love Lifetime movies and Hallmark movies. There's not a ton out there for the literary community. I mean, there's a few and there's a few big ones, but um, it really does fill some white space. Yeah, that that is needed for 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 writers and authors. Well, like your podcast, people have said that what they love about ours is it's like sitting in on a conversation with two creative people, you know, and, and you can learn a lot more sometimes from that sort of thing than from like a pedantic or instructional how to, you know, um, especially with something like writing that is so subjective, there is no how to except write. Yeah, just just do it. Just do it. Now, you mentioned meeting your podcast partner at a writer's conference. I'm curious Mm -hmm. if you could talk to the importance of going to writer's conferences and participating in writer's conferences for anyone out there who is thinking about, you know, doing what it is we've been able to do, which is get some books out into the world. Yeah, I I think it's very valuable for several reasons. Um, First of all, you know, as you know, writing is a very solitary endeavor. So creating community is is important. Um, I've learned something at every writing conference I've gone to. You know, you sit in on these panels about various aspects of craft or about the business. Um, There's also often an opportunity to pitch if you have a project that you're actively pitching or or going to pitch. And it's, I don't know, I just, I find them inspiring. I I think it's, again, you know, I can't stress enough the importance of community in writing. If you, if you're fortunate enough to be able to, you know, build, build out your writing community. Um, I, uh, another thing is that it really, when I went to my first one, it kind of really helped me to feel like, okay, I am a writer. I'm going to a writing conference, you know, anything that you can do until you get published, until you, you know, just to kind of prove to yourself that you're a writer, that you're pursuing this and that you're taking it seriously. Um, The ones I've been to panels have been really interesting. There've been some big name authors, some smaller name authors, a lot about the publishing industry and traditional versus hybrid versus self-publishing. Have you been to a lot of them? I've been to a few. Um, Mm -hmm. And there was one, a big one I was going to go to out in um, San Diego was La Jolla Writers Conference. And um, for whatever reason I had to, I had to miss it. And then COVID came and I I never, never went up going back to that because I did have a credit to go back. But, um, but the ones I've been to, you're absolutely right. It's, it's the panels, but it's the people you meet. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I, I was able to do some like uh, speed dating pitch sessions mm-hmm. and made a few contacts with, you know, both publishers and agents. And it is, uh, you know, my father always said life is contacts. Mm-hmm. Um, so Absolutely. Building, building, I'll use an outdated term, building that Rolodex is yeah <laughs> very important. That, 
my father basically said the same. And actually his Rolodexes are still sitting in his office <laughs> with business cards stapled to them. Um, but yeah, you know, it's great to have contacts. And, you know, I, I've been lucky. I'm sure this, it isn't this way for every writer, but unlike certain other creative pursuits, I've not ever felt competitive with other writers, you know, cause there's enough room for all of our books. Yeah. And there, there's enough room. And I think we're, we're givers as people maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And anything you can do to like help somebody out on their journey, it it does come back to you. I find that it comes back to you, I, um, which isn't a reason to do it. You do it because you want to see somebody else succeed and you want to mentor. Right. But, um, you know, there there's like a karmic <laughs> piece of it, I think. I'd like to believe that. So when did you publish your first book? First one, I want to say 2014, 2014. And forgive me for not knowing this, but fiction or nonfiction? It was, uh, everything's uh, everything's fiction. Um, okay. I, I figure I, I write enough nonfiction for for the day job. Sure. As a marketing consultant, that I um, you know, I, I turned to to fiction. I my my writing came out of a blog I was writing called Confessions of a Focus Group Moderator, uh, which is my my profession. I traveled around the country running focus groups pre pandemic. And I would just write these blog posts about the people who I would meet, you know, in, right. in, in hotel bars, the people who I was interviewing. And, and and it turned into just like like little creative stories about them. And, you know, the blog took off a little bit and people were like, you know, you surely read a book about this. It'd be entertaining. You're so funny. It would be entertaining. Mm -hmm. So I started writing these funny, you know, this funny story about a an aging, you know, former primetime soap opera star from the 80s who finds himself trying to find relevance present day and winds up on a reality TV show. And um, it kind of went from there. And uh, from there, I, I started to write quirky ish mysteries. That, oh, that's very cool. Who, yeah. who, uh, what, what is the name of your first quirky ish mystery? Uncorking a murder. Aha. Uh -huh. I kind of named it after the podcast because uncorking a story came out, I think in 2011 or 2012. Okay. So kind of early in the podcast game. But uh, yeah, and Corking a Murder was the, the first one. And that features Farrah Graham, a podcaster, a true crime type podcaster who winds up solving some mysteries. So when you first, you know, this is my, my first book, a long time coming. When, you, when your first book came out into the world, did it greatly alter the way you felt about yourself as a writer? I mean, not felt about yourself, but like, did it kind of, validate that aspect of your identity seeing it in print yes uh, mm -hmm. seeing somebody read it on the train oh wow when i was commuting to new york yeah that was really cool i took a picture of it and threw it up on social media immediately that's amazing and then the the imposter syndrome sets in oh yeah i mean <laughs> mine mine right this moment mine is is has abated but i know it'll come back I mean, I'm, I'm getting, I've just turned in book two and I'm like, why did they even take a chance on me to write a second book? And, you know, um, it, yeah, the imposter syndrome is, it, it's real. My father, who was a very successful businessman, you know, with a, a long career once said every single day, I wake up and think today's the day they're going to catch on to me, mm -hmm. you know, um, yeah, it's it's I guess it's just part of it. Yeah, but I think you have to kind of keep keep yourself on your toes. You know, How you so? have a little bit of self-doubt. You know, oh, yeah. You don't you don't try as hard the next time around. And I'm always trying to beat, you know, I always say like the, the some people say some people have asked me, well, what's what's the favorite thing you've ever written? And I'm like, it's the thing I'm writing right now. Um, because that's the the thing that I'm I'm most excited about because I know I'm doing it better than I've done previous ones. And I just I get well that's excited about it. That's another thing for any aspiring writers out there. It's something you can do at any point. You know, the um who is it? Uh, Alice Munro published her first book of short stories in her 70s. I might be way off on that, but something like that. And um, you know, there's no you know, it's not like being a runway model. You, you don't age out of it. Um, and you can drink the whole milk with your coffee. But um, 
Yeah, it's really, I I like that answer, the thing that I'm writing right now, because I worry, I mean, this book has been part of my life. This book has been part of my life, you know, for 15, God, no, 17 years. And so I love it. And I feel a little sorry for book two, because it's, you know, um, I, I don't have that feeling and that affection for it yet, but hopefully in subsequent rewrites, I will. Well, I mean, you know, we we always knew in our family growing up that um, our older brother, who was the first child, was my mother's favorite. So maybe it's true. Maybe the first one's always the favorite. But yeah, you'll come to love books two and three. I'm, I'm sure. I will. They're just not the same. Not the you same. know. Um, but so how? When do you find time to write, or when do you make time to write? I make time to write typically in the mornings on my way into New York. I do have a, a fair commute into New York. Okay. So I will write in uh, on uh, planes, trains, and automobiles. Well, maybe not automobiles, yeah. but yeah. planes and trains, um, hotel rooms. Mm-hmm. Whenever you know, whenever I have time, typically not during the day. It's like for me, it's like exercise. I, I have to do it in the morning, or it's not going to happen. Right. So, and my brain is usually fresh and, and awake. I'm a morning person, so I, uh, I I have no fear of of getting it bright and early as the sun's coming up. And do you have like a word count per day or a, no, you don't, I, I don't, I don't have, I don't do that. I don't do that. I write until, um, uh, sometimes when I'm writing, I feel like I'm channeling. So I feel like I'm, oh, I love that. And then when I'm done, I'm done. Um, and, and sometimes that's done mid chapter and then I can pick it back up again the next time. Um, sometimes I, I complete a chapter and I'll, I'll come back, come back to it the next day. But um, I kind of know I kind of know when I'm done. And if I'm lost in time, if, if it's a weekend and and uh, sometimes I I'll lose time, <laughs> and, uh, my wife will come find looking for me <laughs> like, well, what are you doing? What are you doing up there? Right. I'm like oh, I'm writing. So, yeah. How about you? Do you have a time of day when you when you prefer to write? Um, I don't. Well, for because I had such a small window to complete a draft of book two, I went for word count. And I went for, you know, every day, whenever I, I I would schedule it in my calendar, you know, I have, cause you know, as you know, you can't just say, okay, I have from two to three to write and I'm going to write 1500 words. You know, it doesn't work that way. Part of writing for me is pacing. It's looking stuff up. It's like, you know, thinking through how to phrase something. Um, so I don't have a time of day, but I, I, well, now that I'm on deadline, which I certainly wasn't for those 17 years, um, you know, I, it, it, it's good for me to give myself a word count per day. And then, you know, some days I don't meet it. Other days I exceed it. Uh, but it's a totally different process than just writing the first one was. Do you find that it's helpful? Do you find that you're, you're either working more efficiently or, or that the, the story is coming out of you in, in a different way? It is because it's had to. And so I've had a hard time, you know, that channeling that you talk about, you know, I I took myself on a couple of writing retreats in the past year uh, where I would go to hotels in cities where I knew people so I could meet people for dinner and I would just spend the day writing as much as I could. Um, And often that felt like channeling. And then I would second guess myself and say, was, you know, did that just flow out of me or did I force it out because I need to get these, this number word, you know, this many words in today. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it is helpful in that I got it done, you know, and I got it done in a year of some pretty extraordinary personal events. So you know, I, I had to take some time off. I actually, my dad got, did get to know that I finished a draft of book two and he was very proud of me. Yeah. Um, you know, I feel my editor has it. I hope she has major developmental edits for me because I really feel it needs work. My, my agent read it and said, you are so hard on yourself, you know, this, 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 and this, but, um, I don't know. It's so different because the coach check girl evolved so much over the years, obviously, because, you know, it, I was much younger when, when I started it and the world was very different. Um, so I love how it turned out and I don't know that it would have turned out this way had I finished it in a couple of years. Yeah. 
Well, I think the stories come out when 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 it's time for them to come out. <laughs> and it, clearly your characters were knocking on your door telling you, hey, I think I think it's time. I think it's time. Do you know that I think it's Luigi Pirandello play six char- six or eight characters in search of an author? I, oh, I read that sounds fascinating. It is fascinating. I read it in college um, and it's about, you know, a, a playwright with writer's block and his characters come and find him um, because they're tired of, of his not finishing their stories. There was a, um, a a holiday movie last year, the year before. I can't remember. It was, but I, I watched it last year called The Man Who Invented Christmas and it was about Charles Dickens and his writing of A Christmas Carol. And the premise was all of the characters were coming to him, um, like in his daily life to uh, to help him get the story out. It's actually a pretty interesting, interesting watch. Cousin Matthew from uh, from Downton Abbey played the uh, play. Cousin Matthew. Cousin Matthew. Remind me. Cousin Matthew was the one who uh, was uh, killed in an automobile crash <gasps> right oh, after his child was born. Dan, somebody. Um Yes, I know. I know who you mean. OK, he plays. Oh, he plays Dickens. Um, oh, that sounds good. I will look that up. It's a decent one. A decent watch. Well, I, our time together is coming to an end. OK, I want. So we'll do this again tomorrow. We'll do it again tomorrow. Of course. Same bad time, same bad channel. But I, I do want to ask you a couple of questions. I, I try to ask all of my guests to get to know to get to know them just a tad bit better. And uh, usually they revolve around pop culture. And tonight is no different. I'm Uh-oh. Curious, uh, favorite TV shows when you're growing up. Did you have any? When I was growing up, well, I loved the Brady Bunch. Um, I loved the Love Boat. Fantasy Island was too scary. Um, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I mean, those Charlie's Angels I wasn't allowed to watch. Did you have a favorite character on Love Boat? Well, obviously. I had a crush on on Doc. Um, I mean, I who mean, wouldn't? Clearly, who wouldn't? Have clearly, a crush on Doc. Yeah. I, I didn't really have a favorite. I I liked them all for different reasons. I did love Isaac. Mm, finger guns. Yes. <laughs> I, uh, I I'll admit this, and I've admitted this before. When I was growing up, we played Love Boat. So that is uh, so sweet. We did. My my friend Mario was uh, Captain Stubings because he always had to be. You know, the Luke in Star Wars or he had, it, whatever the lead role was, it was him. Right. My brother Jimmy looked like Doc, so he was Doc. So um, that that was Jimbo. I was Gopher. Oh, and, I well, I, I mean, who doesn't love Gopher? Who doesn't love Fred Granby? Um, Fred, yes, thank you. Former thank senator you. or representative. Former, something. Former something. You just reminded me, actually, I also loved Gilligan's Island, and I used oh. to act it out for my sister. I was a one one woman, one girl, Gilligan's Island. That uh, I, l- I love Gilligan, um, but uh, I actually have a couple of love boat references in my latest book that is being shopped around. As- oh, yes. Featuring Isaac, actually. Oh, I love it. Yes. Um, and then um, if you can go back in time and whisper any words of advice into your younger self, um, what would you tell your younger self? Ooh, that's a multifaceted one. Um, well, Apropos of this conversation, I would probably tell myself to just keep writing, keep writing fiction and to believe that I could write a novel because I, I try very hard not to regret, but I do, or, and I do wish I had started this process a lot earlier. But uh, again, I think the, the book came out when it was ready. Exactly. And I, and I love that. And I, and I do believe that. And I do appreciate that. Well, Laura, where can people learn more about you if they want to either look you up? Do you have a website? Do you have any social media that you're active on? I do. I'm Laura Buckwald author on Facebook and Instagram. And my website is Laura Buckwald, B-U-C-H-W-A-L-D.com. And my podcast is available wherever fine podcasts are available. Wherever fine podcasts can be heard. Well, Laura, this yes. has been fun. Thank you so much for stopping by Uncorking a Story and letting me uncork yours. This has been great. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. 
If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story. 